coming up next on The Health Hustle. Everyone is just trying to figure it out. And basically what I mean by that is that a lot of times when people see somebody else, oh, I can't do that. It's like, why can't you do that? Because he's making a million dollars a year and he knows how to do this, this, and that. I don't know exactly, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. And okay, in reality, he probably doesn't know what he's really doing. <laughs> he literally is just chopping away and hopefully he hits it and he ends up doing that. Because the more you chop away, the closer you are to getting to that gold. But people usually just chop away one time and don't ever get there. And so they're like, yeah, I can't find it. Right. So it's literally like that's the most simple advice because I've been around literally some of the biggest influencers in the game. Like I've always looked up to these people my whole life. I've been around them. I've hung around them and they are intelligent, but they're literally just trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Like it's just it's it's just absolutely mind blowing when you hang around these people like Mr. Beast. Fantastic. I, I, I met the guy, but I actually do know two big YouTubers that he does know. And these big YouTubers are super successful. But like I have like one of them has stayed in my place for two weeks and the guy's literally like sitting there like stressing out because he doesn't know what the video is going to be tomorrow. And nobody knows what the video is going to be tomorrow. He's got to figure it out. So it's like <laughs> when you look at it like that, it just you're like, wow, OK, life isn't as complicated as I thought it was. No, and it's really not. Hey, folks, and welcome to the Health Hustle of Austin, Texas. On the show, we uncover the big ideas from your fellow health and fitness entrepreneurs in the Austin, Texas area about how they built their business and the lessons they learned along the way. I'm your host, Corey Hibben, and on this episode, I had a chance to sit down with Logan Sneed, who feels like a long-lost brother from another mother. I honestly had an awesome time hearing a story about how he was able to overcome cancer at such an insanely young age and how that has shaped him to being just so incredibly grateful for life today. On this episode, we get into the moment he had to wake up in the middle of a brain surgery, what it feels like to be given a diagnosis that was basically a death sentence, a moment of great mentorship, a moment of terrible mentorship, why he was so dead set on dropping out of college, the biggest mistake young entrepreneurs make, a rapid fire question round, how even people at the tippy top of business are still just figuring it out and so much more. If you haven't already, do me a huge favor and please subscribe and write us a review. This show is about helping health and fitness professionals to build a business that fits your lifestyle by giving us a review. It helps other people find the show and join us on the journey. If you're looking for simple and actionable tips on how to market and grow your health business, click the link in the description and sign up for my three tips Tuesday newsletter. Three tips every Tuesday to help you keep those leads coming. If you need help with building your website, I offer a free website audit that you can find at coreyhigh.com. Without further ado, let's go. Logan Sneed, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm great. I've uh, been following your content for a while, like a lot of people, and have listened to a number of your episodes. And so what I'm hoping to pull out of this episode specifically is I think if most people wanted to find out your story about you obviously overcoming brain cancer and starting a business and everything that came with that, they could read your book or listen to a lot of other podcast show out, shows out there. So the angle I want to take and kind of the starting point for some of this is to like, let's just give maybe just like the short version of that story, just so people can understand you a little better about where you came from and kind of the obstacle that you overcame. And then after that, we'll get more into like kind of the business that you're working on and what you're building out today. Yeah. Yeah. And feel free to uh, interrupt me in this to ask any questions as I go along. But it was uh, March 6th of 2016 when I literally, it was like an amazing day in my life. I thought it was, felt great. I was grateful. I was happy. And I was in such a good mood. I was like, I'm just going to call my girlfriend. I feel, I feel like it's a great day. And I was going to the gym and I just started FaceTiming her. I was like, hey, happy uh, Wednesday. I feel great today. I'm just gra grateful for you and everything. And like, we were just chatting. And then suddenly like I started stuttering hard and slurring my words. And then I was like, I couldn't say what I wanted to say. Like it was, almost, it was like I was being controlled by something else almost where words couldn't come out of my mouth, but they were in my head. Hmm. And I just had, a, I started having a random seizure while I was on a FaceTime with her while I was driving. And literally, I literally passed out after seizing and then drove half a mile unconscious. I uh, literally drove into a ditch. There was actually no car damage. Like I was going like 60 miles an hour, just psh, straight into a ditch. And uh, woke up in the hospital and they were like, okay, let's drug test the guy. Let's alcohol test the guy. Let's like figure this thing out. And they were like, yeah, there's nothing here. They're like, we don't, we don't know what's going on. And they were like, the only option that's left is, is to get an MRI to see if there's anything, you know, neurologically that's being damaged or whatever. So went to go get an MRI, um, came back and they were like, yeah, there's something in there. And, and I didn't really know what was going on. My parents whenever they said, yeah, there's something in there, they're getting a little scary, a little scared. 
So they're like, you guys should see a neurologist pretty quickly. And so went to go see a neurologist like the next day. The neurologist was like, you guys need to see a neurosurgeon pretty quickly. So then like within 24 hours later, I go see a neurosurgeon and this guy's here in Austin as well. And I didn't know I would have to have brain surgery, but the guy was like, yeah, you gotta have brain surgery. This is like pretty serious, but you won't speak or hear after this. So all within like 48 hours, life is like on top of the world. You know, you have, you have your gratitude and like, oh, so grateful today. It's just an amazing day. And then boom, completely gone. So as soon as the guy told me I wouldn't speak or hear after that, I was like, oh my God, I was like, I have to get brain surgery and this is going to happen. I'm literally going to go like mute for the rest of my life almost. So then we left there and there were my parents, thankfully, just very strong minded. They were like, we're not going to work with that guy. We're going to find somebody better. So I got connected with uh, Dr. Raymond Sawaya. And if, if those that are listening, they don't know who he is, definitely look him up because he is the best in the world at brain surgeries. So I asked him, I was like, am I going to speak or hear after this? He was like, yeah, you'll be fine, dude. Hmm. I was like, what? I was like, I just talked to a guy yesterday. He said, no, I would like be done. He was like, no, no, don't, don't even worry about, don't worry about that. Like I'll make, I'll make it easy. It's like, wow. Okay. He's like, but we've got to start doing some training from right now, which was 8am in the morning to about 8pm in the afternoon to get ready for brain surgery at 6am in the morning tomorrow. And I was like, Phew. Okay. So I literally was doing like all these, you know, okay, touch your nose. Okay. Do you remember what happened 10 minutes ago? Like all these crazy trainings. And like, for those that don't know uh, much about MD Anderson, it's, it's a university, literally a university. It's like the, it's the number one cancer center in the country and potentially the world. Um, so I was literally going from building to building to room to room, doctor to doctor. And I was getting, I literally got like three, three MRIs that day. And dude, I just randomly passed out in the middle of walking to my next MRI. Like it was so bad and like, it was so stressful. Right. And so then I literally go, go to bed that night, had to wake up at like 5 AM to go to the surgery and walk in there. And like, you know how a church is where it's got like those aisles, mm -hmm. right? So it's like those aisles. Basically that's how it was when you walk, when I walked into the hospital and at the end of that aisle is the host, you know, you check in, right. And then there's like, this little aisle one, aisle two and three, and in each little aisle, little kind of hangout area, there's like families, right? It's very dark. And each little family in every single aisle is either like sobbing because their kid's gonna get brain surgery. This person's probably gonna die the next day. This person doesn't know what the hell's gonna go on. And I'm walking in there like, what the hell is happening here? And it's like dark. So I go in there, they change me up. I, I sign my waivers, all that stuff. And then they put me into this stretcher and they bring in this priest to say like a last prayer with everybody. Jesus. <laughs> like it was very, I'm like, <laughs> I sure hope I make it out and I'm glad we're saying a prayer here, but let's be a little bit more confident here. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, anyways, I go in there and like, I just, I'll never forget, like I, I'm not dating the same girl anymore, but I'll just never forget like looking back and she's, you know, you've seen a movie where it's like this whole, like one guy goes to a big war and the wife stays back and they're sobbing and sorrow. Like that's literally what it was. And I looked back and she's like crying right there and I'm going drug into this room. And so anyways, I go in there. It was literally like a room that you see in a movie, you know, all this caution stuff. And there's like the, you know, in a football game, you got the offensive coordinator defensive in the, you know, in the press box. And that's literally what they had there. They had their four doctors lined up and then boom, they just suddenly like knock me out. And they did have to wake me up in the middle of the surgery to ask me questions to make sure that I could still speak in here. And so the reason they did that is because let's say that I couldn't speak in here. And they're like, hey, Logan, who's the president of the United States right now? And if I couldn't answer that, then they, they, they would have to cut the surgery off short. Do you remember waking up or were you just so out of it? I do. Know? I do, actually. I do remember they asked me um, who my brothers are. They asked me what date it was or at least like, you know, September 11th, 12th, 13th. Right. Sure. Um, and then it was like, who's the president? What's your favorite sport? And what high school did you go to? And they're probably also like, don't move because we have a scalpel in your brain right now. So don't mess this up. Oh, they didn't have to tell me that. I was literally just like, <laughs> yeah, uh, Caden and Tyler, that's my brother's like, okay, cool, cool. And, and the president, I'm like, uh, Donald Trump. I think, no, it was, I think it was Obama or whatever, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like, yeah. you know, at that time. So it was like, uh, yeah, I, I clearly remember that. Wow. Um, so anyways, they take me back and then, uh, it was very, very hard because I had to go in like this, this recovery room. 
So it's not like you go, your surgery's done, then suddenly, boom, okay, bring in family, say hello. Like, there's also like a 10 hour period of like recovering. Mm. So I had to go in there and recover, and that was bizarre. That was almost like worse because you're just sitting in a chamber for 10 hours, no phone, no, no, nothing to look at. They're just like, you're literally just sitting there. Then finally, surgery's done. The guy, the surgeon came in, was like, yeah, it's completely gone. Like, I removed 100% of this. And I was like, oh, okay. Thanks. I mean, like, that's great. Life goes on. Like, it's all good. Gave him a high five and went your separate ways? Yeah, or? well, I mean, he was like, he was like, yeah, man. I mean, like, 100% of it's gone. I don't know what the diagnosis is, but that's great news. It's all gone. And so I, I didn't know anything about, like, cancer. Diagnose. I didn't know anything about that. So I was like, cool. Life goes on. And I wasn't worried. I didn't even, like, think about it. And I was just ready to get out of there. So a week and a half goes by for the diagnosis. They <laughs> they accidentally sent the diagnosis via email, which is literally against like the law right. in their in their their protocols. Yeah, HIPAA. So they sent the email on accident late at night. My my mom's like bawling her eyes out in the office, and I was like, "What, what the hell's going on?" And then she like called me in, called my dad in, shut the door. And like explain what was going on. And then like I didn't really, I still didn't fully get it. And she's like crying. I'm like, what, what is happening? So anyways, the doctor calls in and I still didn't fully get it. And it was like literally probably a day or two later, we go see the neuro oncologist is what it is. And so that's when we go in and get the diagnosis, like full throttle. And she's like, yes, this is a stage four glioblastoma brain tumor. Your life expectancy is about one to 10 years. And we're really, I mean, we're just going to try chemo and radiation and there's really nothing we can do. Well, even though you had the brain tumor out, why did you still have to continue to do that? That's unknown. I mean, I wish I could tell you the answer because like they said like, Hey, like we don't know if we full, they, they said we removed hundred percent of the tumor, Sure. but we don't know if there's any little small traces that are like not even measurable mm. of cancer that could still be there. We just don't know. They were like, yeah, you could be completely cancer free and fine. Or there could be still, still some traces of cancer that is just, you can't measure it and you can't find it. Wow. So she just basically told me, she's like, yeah, your life expectancy is one to 10 years. Like it's really what it's going to look like. And then she was like, yeah, chemo radiation, like we'll try it out and like, we'll do the best we can, but that's really about it. So my dad immediately was like, okay, but like, any like foods he should eat, not eat, like, I don't know, cut sugar off. Is that, does that help at all? And he said it in a kind of sarcastic way as <laughs> in like, no duh. Right. And she was like, well, I mean, honestly, like it's just not really going to do much. I mean, there's really nothing like that won't help it. It's not going to hurt it. So, I mean, it's not really a big deal. And he was like, whoa, 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 hold on. So like he can go like eat just McDonald's and then go have some beers and stuff. And like, that's not going to help it. It's not going to hurt it. And she was like, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's just not going to do much. I was like, what the, like, this is bizarre. So yeah. Implying that lifestyle choices have no impact on your life expectancy is basically what she's saying, which is ludicrous. Yeah. Dude, she almost, she almost felt like a, a God to me for a second. Hmm. Like you are going to be dead. You will not do anything that's going to help this. This is what's going to happen. Like it was I like, it really, I mean, it hurt me very, very emotionally, sat in it, like a sad way, right? But then a very angry way. So I leave that off. I leave that diagnosis, and I didn't, I didn't know, I don't know what the hell to think. Like I thought I was like, I lit. My first thought was, I'm not going to commit suicide, but I was like, I don't mind if I die, because what else am I going to do, right? Because if she's got the toughest job in the world, like super, super serious job, they say there's only like, only a couple hundred neuro oncologists in the world. Because of how difficult of a job it is. Mentally or just emotionally? You know what I mean? Like, because I could imagine maybe both. Because, like, obviously mentally it's, like, you got to be smart as hell to be able to do it. Yeah. But also emotionally of, like, you're dealing with one of the most difficult things there is to overcome, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, when she said that, though, I was like, well, if she doesn't know the answers and she's literally studied this her whole life. And I don't know what the hell this is. Like, how am I supposed to figure this out? I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. So that's how I went into this like very, very dark state of my life. And I was like, you know, I, I, I vividly remember just like very late at night. I was still staying with my family um, at that time. And I was like literally just bawling my eyes out, like sitting next to my bed every night. Like, I'm going to be dead. Like, I thought I had this life I wanted to live. 
I was like, I dream of this. I'm with an amazing girl right now. Like couldn't get better. And I'm literally just in dark, like cave alone right now. Yeah. You felt hopeless. Yeah. No one, no. I mean, people can relate to it, but it's very hard to relate to like literally a life sentence. Right. Then it is to say, oh, I've been, you know, upset and had hard times. So everyone's got their hard times and I haven't, you know, fallen out of a plane or I haven't, right. there's things I haven't been through that other people have, but this is a very, very particular situation that it's very hard to understand. So anyways, time goes by. I didn't know what I was going to do. Didn't think of anything. My parents were kind of doing research behind the scenes of like what is beyond what they said that we could do. And I was actually out here on the Ladybird Lake uh, one time with my mentor and he was like, tell me how you feel. And I was like, I don't feel anything. Like I feel it dead. Like I, there, I can't do anything. So what am I, I don't want, I don't, I don't feel happy. I don't feel depressed. Like I'm already dead. And he's like, have you heard of the keto diet? And I was like, no, I'm not. What, what's that? He was like, well, they have, they do have research that shows that it could shrink tumors or prevent tumor regrowth. And the research was specifically for glioblastoma tumors, which is what my tumor was. And I was like, okay. And what does that look like? he was like, well, it's just a high fat, medium protein, low carb diet. And he was like, there is a Duke study that just recently came out with this stuff. He was like, I'd look into it and you got nothing to lose. And I was like, yeah, I got nothing to lose. I was like, I don't care what it is. I don't care. I don't care if people hate it, love it. Like I have to do something hmm. like, cause not, let's just say it was an absolute, let's say it was completely lying to me. There would have been a placebo effect to that. Where I'm like, this is going to work. This is going to work. This is going to work, right? Right. So I did the research like that night and I was like, what is the keto diet? And this is when no one talked about it. Like literally not a soul on Instagram was showing this. Not a single person. And it said that you could, you know, shrink tumors, prevent tumor regrowth. It actually was discovered because it cures uh, epilepsy. So I was like, oh, okay. The doctor, they were putting me on, putting me on temozolomide because they said I would, I would have at least one seizure a month. And I was like, okay, well, if this cures seizures, then forget that. And it says you can you know, use body fat and get lean and like reduce stress. They even treat people with depression and anxiety with it as well. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm just going to do it. So I literally did the next day. I still obviously didn't know what I was doing. I just did what it said. And then from there on out, like I literally went keto for probably five, six years straight. I ended up showing it on Instagram. I was like, Hey guys, like I know everyone's doing carb cycling to lose fat. I did this. It's called keto to like, you're making that up. That's fake. And I was like, I don't know. I just Duke university. Like, I think they, they just talked about it. And like, I suddenly saw crazy results in my body. Like, like insane. People thought it was like crop. Like I can show you after this, but like, it was pretty insane what my physique was like. I've seen some of the photos. You're shredded. It was like really, really shredded. And, and it was all in the middle of chemotherapy and radiation. And I started showing that like all at the same time, like, Hey, I'm on keto. I'm in chemo. I'm in radiation. This is my body. Now they're like, what? So people were like, freaking out and they're like they're like you're an x-man there's no way you're getting ready. yeah no <laughs> legit like it was pretty crazy now that i go back and think about it and then they were like well could i like could i buy a program from you and i was like i don't have a, y yeah sure great answer so i was like yeah here it is and then like it just suddenly like took off and i was in the middle of it and i was like whoa i was like i, I made 200 bucks today and i was like whoa i made 300 bucks today and then i i'll never forget i made like I think I made almost a thousand and I told my girlfriend at the time, cause the reason I was wanted to drop out of college, right? I, I literally, as soon as I got there day one, I told my girlfriend, I told my mom, I'm going to drop out of college one day. I don't feel like I belong here. I don't want to be here. I'm going to build my own thing. I don't know what it is, but this is what I'm going to do. And the time was coming to where I was like, Whoa, 500 bucks, 800 bucks in a day. I was like, what did your mom say when you told her you were going to drop out of college before you even started college? She was like, she, she basically said, she's like, Hey, well, I mean, if you can build something that is going to make it just as much, if not more money than having a job, then yeah, that's fine. But you're not, you're not dropping out until that actually mm, happens. She wanted proof in the pudding. Yeah. I, and I was like, all right. I like that. <laughs> so yeah. And basically it really started happening. I showed my girlfriend at the time. I was like, look, I just made 800 bucks today. Look at this. She still didn't believe it. She's like, no, you didn't. And I was like, yeah, look, it's right there. And she got like a little upset about it. Not because of like that I was becoming successful, but she probably didn't feel that she knew what she wanted in her life. Right. And if I'm saying, hey, look, I'm going to build this up. I'm going to drop out. Life goes on. Like money's not a problem. I mean, you could drop out if you wanted to. You know what I'm saying? Like she probably was like, well, what's the purpose of me? Mm. You know? So anyways, 
time's going by. I'm getting super, like, I'm getting very motivated, like more motivation than I've ever had in my life. Um, I was listening to some YouTube videos, this guy, your, your world within on YouTube, literally listened to all his like motivational videos. It completely changed my life and life was going right back up. And then suddenly I got this text one morning from the girl. I was with her the night before broke up, broke up with me over a very long text message. And it literally just brought me right back down. I, she was like one of my only like really, like I, I knew other people in my life, but it was like literally who I spent time with every single day. And I didn't want to be at college. So obviously I was still literally only there because I was still with her. Right. And as soon as I got that text, I literally never saw her again. I was literally just sitting there bawling my eyes out. And I was like, what, what the hell am I going to like, what do I do now? And I called my mom and I was like, yeah, this is just what happened. She's like, I'll be there tomorrow morning and picking you up. Mm. Literally threw everything in the car, dropped out literally that same exact day and life went on. And then I just built my own business. I ended up going to uh, live at the domain. I was like 20 years old and like life was on my own. I was super nervous, scared, but excited. And then the rest became history. And now it's built the life I've always wanted and built a seven figure business. Now i got a business partner in Spain, traveling the world. And yeah. What I really want to double tap from that story is just this idea of like white and black magic, which I think a lot about of just the power of words. Cause you touched on it a number of times between like even having two different doctors that have different opinions to mentors that have had different opinions to your parents saying certain things to you at pivotal points of your life. Cause like, not that I'm even going to begin to try to relate to your story, but I've in, when I was like 17, I was in a very, very dark stage as well from a girl that broke up with me and yeah. totally crushed me. And to the point of like suicidal thoughts, and yeah. like it was emotionally one of the hardest things ever and for me the thing that really pulled me out of that was actually again I was as lucky as well to have really great parents because my mom at the time saw how sad I was and she invited me to go to the gym she was going mm. to the YMCA at the time and I was like just in a super dark spot and I was like yeah do anything right in the same way that you were willing to do anything when your mentor said well have you heard of this keto thing and it put this light bulb of like well fuck yeah. I don't I don't know but I'm willing to try anything right and yeah. it was the same thing for me with fitness and health and exercises like going to the gym and just like trying to figure out how to do this fitness thing essentially like and it wired in my brain this association of like exercise and health and happiness and it just kind of tied all those things together and I always think about it though of the aspect of like but it could have been anything right it could have been your mentor instead of saying keto maybe he's like this is an extreme example but he's like well have you ever tried like drugs or have you ever tried <laughs> yeah. like alcohol or marijuana and you could have gone down that path yeah yeah very right? true so i just think a lot about that of like there's just this this game of like timing and luck that plays into it and now obviously looking back at it i'm sure you're grateful for all those experiences and where yeah. you are today would you change anything i feel like i know the answer but no i mean no, I, I wouldn't change a thing. It's, I mean, if I can go back and be like, oh, well, you could have worked on this in your business. You could have gotten better at that. It's like, can't go change it. So why worry about it? Right. You know? Yeah. So I'm grateful for every moment that happened. And I mean, I've now been able to change so many lives, whether it's through their diet, their mindset, their business, those things. Like, I'm so grateful for that. Like, I'll take that any day. That's why people live, at least what I think. And if people are like, well, that's not my goal to change people's lives. It's like, well, your goal is to what then? And if their goal is to even just say, oh, I just want to make money. It's like, well, you still want to be happy. Money won't make you happy. Everybody wants approval in one way or another. You can get it from changing somebody's life or you can get it to try and impress people. Good luck with that. Right. So it's like everybody wants approval and wants to feel valuable in the world. And for me, it was changing people's lives. Mm. So Yeah, I think uh, somebody earlier on the show, I think they, they said something along the lines of, do you want to be something or do you want to do something? Mm. And I think a lot about that of like so often, especially in today's world with social media, people are trying to like be something. I want to I wanna be a YouTuber or yeah. I want to be a podcaster or I want to be this thing. It's like, well, what do you actually want to do though? Yeah. Like how do you actually want to make a difference and help people? Because that's the thing that's actually going to bring some fulfillment to your life. Yeah. I want to, so let's circle back to, so you were getting people reaching out to you about this keto program. They were seeing you were shredded. I feel like it's like a lot, how a lot of people get into the fitness, health, nutrition space. They're like, oh my God, you're jacked. How do I do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you make that transition though from like, okay, you grow, you grew this like fitness, health, nutrition business into essentially you started doing coaching after that, right? Yeah. What did that transition look like for you? Well, first off, what was actually very interesting to people is that I was very relatable to them because they saw that I had a crazy transformation in my own body. And they were like, 
whoa, okay, he's not this guy with a million followers taking steroids, eight pack abs, you know, and just perfect body, whatever. They saw I literally went from zero to a hundred, you know? So it's like, that's what was relatable. And I did it in the middle of chemotherapy and radiation. So basically they were like, wow, I've got no excuses. So that's what really kind of made him interested. But yeah, the guy who actually told me about the keto diet, he was actually my mentor all the way through high school. He ended up becoming a uh, business partner with me and it, it did not go well. We were actually sitting at that Whole Foods over there and uh, he was like, yo man, like, you know, I can really help you build this thing up, become massively successful. I see how it's doing and let's really make this a big, big business. And I was 20 years old and I, the guy was super, super successful. I trusted my life with him and I was like, yeah, let's do it. So I would go to his lawyer, sign, you know, legal agreements, didn't know a thing I was saying. I just signed it because I trusted him. Basically, I gave him 40% of my business. He put in $0 and he literally went a whole year traveling the world, went to like South Africa, everything. And I'm just sitting there in my, in my apartment, just like grinding, just making money. Like that's literally all I'm trying to do. And 40% of every dollar that I made goes to him. He's not doing a thing, put in zero bucks. And I'm just trying to make money to, to you know, still be alive. Like what did he sell you on that? He was going to like mentor you or something like what it was, did... it was basically like, I mean, that's the thing. That's the problem, man. I can, I can be sold easy to be honest <laughs> with you. And like, I was like, this guy's successful. Like he's got land. Like I've looked up to this guy my whole life. Like, why would I not like what's, I, I already know he's going to bring so much value. Did I know what the value was? No, mm. but I just knew he was going to bring value. And then he comes in and wants to teach me on how to save money. And like, and I'm like, yo, I, I'm not building a business to learn how to save money. I'm building a business to learn how to make money. So I'm not sure what this is going to help me with. So like, it just kept getting worse and worse. I had to have a serious, you know, quote unquote, breakup talk, if you will. I ended up having to give him like $60,000 and it was an absolute disaster. And then eventually I had this guy message me on Instagram. What? In the middle of all that. And I was, he was like, yo, I'd love to help you in this. And I was like, bro, I don't know who you are. You're in Ireland. Okay. I've already got a disaster going on here. He's like, no, 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 but for real, like, I'll, I'll help you out. I turned him down for literally six months. Like he got rejected like every single week for six months straight. He still kept coming back. The one thing that, that made me say like, I'm going to give you an opportunity was because he did more work by getting rejected for six months straight than the guy who has 40% of the business who didn't do jack squat. So I was like, okay, right there. The fact that you did work and I've already said no, it's like, you're going to get an opportunity. And he was like, and watch, you don't have to pay me a single dime until the end of that first month. I was like, okay. And then he was like, we're not even going to do legal agreements at all. This is a shake of a hand because I trust you as an influencer. And if you're good at what you do, I trust you or you, you'll trust me and I'll trust you. So it's a very mutual shake of a hand thing. Do not condone this. Do not recommend this to people online. Do not do this. <laughs> but it was literally one of the best decisions I've ever made. And now we've been working together for six years straight. Now we've built a seven figure coaching business and now we've transitioned. And that transition that we made was because we kind of were just doing some math of like, you know, the scalability and this type of stuff. And we're like, okay, I've gotten so many messages of people asking me how I built this business. So if I've already got, if I got that question, that's another business right there to build. So we ended up coaching fitness coaches on how to build their online coaching business. Then after that, we've now transitioned to helping more broad, more like online coaches in general, like mindset, health coaches, life coaches, whatever coaches, how to build their coaching business, generate more leads and really scale it. So, which I want to get into, but before we do, I want to pull two things out of that. Yeah. One is that that piece to you just like really being open to saying yes to a mentor. I think that's actually great in the sense that uh, I think about the show like uh, Shark Tank a lot uh -huh, uh -huh. about so often they always pitch these like ludicrous percentages right but at the same time for just that relationship like i mean it kind of yeah. is kind of worth it in a lot of ways exactly. i would say so it's really unfortunate that this one just didn't pan out so like bummer do you talk to that guy at all ever again or have you ever I, heard back from him i haven't i haven't talked to him in a couple of years okay I, th I think i mean i forgive I, I forgive yeah i mean i've got nothing no grudge to hold right money comes back time doesn't so sure. I, I don't i don't hate the guy i think he's i think he's a good guy Love I that. really do. So. Um, and then the other thing is like the tenacity of this, uh, this other guy out of Ireland, I think you said is what, so what was he, is he doing social media? Like what was he doing? Like what was the partnership with this guy or how did that play out? Yeah. So more, more of like the back end stuff. 
So like right now we've got like a team of like four or five employees who like literally do all the back end, the like basically the labor work, right? So he leads all of those. He does the hiring, he does the scaling things. We have an ad manager he that he leads and that he does, he basically goes through that process with. So all the back end stuff that nobody wants to really do hmm. is what he does and who he brings people on to, you know, help with. I love that, man. That's cool. You guys are still working yeah. together. Does he ever come to Austin? He has never been to Austin yet, but I'm, I'm really getting on to him to come. I just went to Spain for his wedding. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's such a crazy story. Okay. So let's get into the coaching business you're doing now then. Yeah. So obviously you've opened the doors up to being more broader reach with your coaches. Tell us about that transition then. So you were more in the fitness health space. Like what did you have to do in that stage? Did you have to like rebrand? Did you have to build a team? What did you do exactly? Yeah. So like when I was, when I, when I was a nutrition fitness coach and I went to the coaching of those coaches, there were people asking me a lot of questions. Hey, like, how do you do this? And I was like, okay, I see other coaches in this space that are doing exactly that. They're making fantastic money and I've already done it myself. So I'm pretty confident I could grow this thing pretty quick. Mm. So I did that. And then as time went by, I basically made a transition to go kind of a little bit more broad, right? It's kind of like Tony Robbins. People are like, Oh, I want to be Tony Robbins. I'm like, what does he coach in? They're like, everything. Yeah. Fitness, mindset, life, finances, everything. I'm like, okay, is that where he started? They're like, I don't, I don't know. I'm like, okay, he was a, cig- he was a cigarette uh, addiction coach to start. Like, that's super niche specific. So that's what I started with. And then as time goes by, he got more broad because he built a bigger audience. Yep. So that's what I was able to do, kind of making that transition. I think like going from like the only fitness PTs to fully online. I made that transition too, because I did want to reach out or I did want to help, you know, mindset life coaches and those things, not just the PT one, you know, same method, same approach to all of them, just, you know, targeting different markets and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you shared that. Cause I think that is the challenge of most people is like, I actually had a conversation with a buddy about that, about like, uh, Elon Musk, right? Is everyone's like, oh, like Elon Musk does like all these things and he's just like the head guy and he hires other people. I was like, well, yeah, if you know Elon Musk in day one, he was like locked in a room writing code to like actually create PayPal like by himself. Is like you got to understand yeah. like where he started to like get him to where he's at now, right? Yeah. Because everybody likes to see the end game and nobody wants to start in the beginning game. It's so often. Yeah. I'm even like, as especially too, as like a marketing agency that I run, I'm kind of been thinking a lot about like a program that's just focused on helping people figure out that that niche or that tilt or that unique angle because that's arguably the thing that's going to make the biggest difference and that's the thing i feel like most people struggle with and when all the coaches that you work with like what are maybe the most common things you notice that people struggle with or deal with or have difficulties overcoming they can't get leads Hmm. it's probably the number one biggest problem but there's always a route to that problem because some people come on and say oh I'm, i'm i'm great at sales my content's fantastic. I just can't get leads. And I'm like, you say your content's fantastic, but you can't get leads. Do those things go together at all? And they're like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay. So content's probably not fantastic, it sounds like. Well, it, it looks good. I'm like, okay. So there's a difference between looking good and actually making it perform good. Hmm. And then it's like, Okay, so why is the content not good? Well, uh, I don't know. And I'm like, okay, who do you coach? I coach people on losing weight. Hmm. Okay, people, right? People losing weight. There's literally millions and millions of you out there. So people don't fully understand what you fully offer or what problem you solve. So that's why you can't generate leads. Okay, well, what do we do then? Well, let's figure out what the problem is you're solving, what your niche is. Again, it's literally a step one problem. Mm Mm-hmm. So when you look at it all together, people come to me saying leads are their problem. And yes, it is a problem, but they don't understand that there's literally roots and roots and roots and roots of that problem. People are like, I, I, I'm just not sleeping well. Okay. So what do you do the night before? I, I don't know. I'm just like, I'm, I'm watching TV and then I go to bed and I take a melatonin. And I should, I'm trying to like, it's just not working. And I'm like, okay, is that the only thing? I, I mean, yeah, I think so. I'm like, okay, what do you eat in a day? I'm, I'm, it's just McDonald's. 
Okay. So tell me more, <laughs> tell me more. Right. And there's always a bigger, bigger root of that problem. Sure. So <laughs> no, I totally agree. Uh, it, I have similar conversations all the time with so many of my clients is I had one not that long ago who she's, uh, I, I also work with people in like the health and fitness space and, uh, she's like, uh, some sort of skincare products or something like that. I think it was. And I was like, well, who's the product for? And she's like, well, everybody. And like a part of my soul died, right? Yeah. She's like, well, everybody could use it, like grandpas and kids. And I was like, well, is everybody going to get the best results from the product if they all use it? Well, no, probably not. Well, okay. So like who's going to get the best results from the product? And let's start going down that road, right? Yep. That's why I said like I've been playing with this idea of just like literally creating an entire program that's focused on like how do we figure out this niche or your unique yeah. selling proposition or whatever it is. Cause like that is so often root one of people in that business space. So anybody listening, <laughs> do not be that person. Yeah. So what's the biggest mistake you feel like you've made in business? And that could be emotionally or monetarily. I would say two problems. Number one, not being patient enough. And I mean that, I don't mean that in the sense of like, Oh, okay. I'm not getting results. I, I'm giving up. I mean that in the sense of like, not being patient enough to look at the long-term game. I used to be in it for the short term. And I mean that in the sense of like, oh my gosh, today I didn't get a sale. Today's a terrible day. It sucks. I was a failure. Oh, bad day. Right? It's like, okay, yeah. You look at one bad day, it's a bad day. But let's look at it in a month. Right? It's like, let's say you got two sales at 10K. It's 20,000. Or let's say you got 10 sales at 1,000. That's 10 sales versus two. What makes more money? The two. So how many days of that month did you get a sale? Only two days out of that month, but you made more in that month than you did if you got 10, right? So it's like the bigger picture of the long-term game. And that's what I really struggled with for a long time. And I would stress out over the simplest problems, the simplest problems, like, oh my God, it went from 4,000 likes to 2,500. Like when <laughs> my account was like viral back then. And like, it was so daunting and just like how much, the business controlled me, not on how I controlled the business. Hmm. Um, so that was number one. I think number two was the fear of investing. I was building up, you know, amazing money. I was right before I was 21 years old. I had a hundred thousand in my account and I was like, Oh my God, this is still not enough. Like this is just, I'm going to, I'm literally going to go broke tomorrow. Like, and it's just like, obviously that's not going to happen. Right. I still didn't feel like it was enough. So I was still scared to, reinvest into myself, get a coach, those things. I, I never got a coach. Like that's one of my biggest quote unquote regrets, if you will, is I never got a coach. I was just so scared of making such a hefty investment. And I had such a mindset of like, oh my God, it's so much money. And like, I'm just going to lose it in a click of a button. And like, it's just stuff like that. Right. But it's like a coach can literally help you accelerate 20 times faster than if you were just to sit there and grind all day to figure it out. You know, so I hear that advice so often on this show of like mentorship. I talk about it all yeah. the freaking time. I was actually just watching a Mr. Beast video the other day. Uh, totally my guilty vice. <laughs> yeah. I love Mr. Beast. Yeah. But uh, he was talking about like he tells all of the people that works for him of like, get a mentor, get yeah. a coach, get somebody that can short track what you're trying to do. And he, he refers it to the fact of like when he was building this YouTube channel, which is now like the biggest YouTube yeah. channel in the world, he's like, I had nobody to mentor me. So it was a lot of pain and trial and error and trying to figure it out. He's like, yep. if I knew then what I know now and I could just like go back and tell myself what to do, he's like, I would have been hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of followers farther along. And so yeah. like it's true for any endeavor, right? So you, do you still have mentors and coaches now today in your life that you work with? I don't really have a mentor or a coach I have other coaches programs so it's not like I'm getting like one-on-one -on -one coach every day sure. I think my dad is a great sort of he's one of my best friends if you will I wouldn't say that we sit there and like do mentor sessions but like we just talk about everything um, and I do have another friend his name is Chris Lynn do you know Chris mm -mm. no okay he goes to the well a lot but anyways uh, I would say he's a partial mentor of mine he's very 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 successful in the stock market and stuff he has no experience in this coaching space but like life in general and money and finances and stuff, he's very successful. So I'll kind of learn from him and stuff like that. So I love that. Yeah. I mean, mentorship shows up in a lot of forms, right? Yeah. Podcasting books. Yeah. I would argue though, like having an actual real mentor is probably one of the best though. I know. I know. I, I really do. I, I think it is good. I mean, you want to find somebody who can understand and relate to what you're trying to grow in, you know, which can take some time as far as like, let's say a full life mentor, mm. right? I, just cause you see somebody who says life coach in their bio, 
doesn't mean that somebody should go invest twenty thousand dollars with. Especially here in Austin. Yeah. There's a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about like where you're going with this journey then. So obviously you come from overcoming cancer to starting a keto business to coaching to coaching other coaches and now moving forward we briefly touched on it if you want to open yeah. up about it but uh, where do you see things kind of moving forward what's on the horizon yeah man i just i mean i'm i really want to want that business to grow more and more and more so there's still a whole lot more potential with it um and then i'm also <clears throat> i'm sure people on here have seen supersize me again i don't want to say oh it's finalized and yes i'm 100 percent doing it but it's just been kind of those you know little uh short talks, you know, quick jibber jabber. So I'm talking with one of the producers of Supersize Me who I was connected with on, hey, like this is my idea of coming out with a documentary about why people are getting cancer. I, again, I hope, I trust everybody listening to this, but there's literally no documentary about this. There is about sugar. There is, you know, maybe about a few other things, but not for the reasons that I would kind of dive into. There's really no other documentary about it. Plus there's no documentary, at least unless I, unless there is, I haven't seen it, about somebody's story going into that journey of figuring out the why behind it. Mm. So because of that, I've got not only a story with it, I know all the doctors who've done research based around all these sort of topics and one of the best producers in the game, number one documentary in the world, basically. It's in the talks, he's liking the idea. I just don't, I don't wanna say, yeah, I'm 100% do it and then it's not done, but that's what's on my mind right now. Whatever happens, um, I sure hope you get to do it no matter what plays out. Cause yeah. like, that would be awesome. You yeah. I mean, even if it doesn't play with the exact people in the exact way with the exact funding, I still yeah. hope you do it. Cause like, uh, as somebody who personally loves documentaries, I think that'd be awesome. Mm. But also too, have you seen super high me? No. <laughs> so it was a spin on super size me. It was about a guy who smoked weed for 30 days every day, all day. <laughs> That's hilarious. He was a, he was a stand up comedian. And so, like, I feel like the only way he was, like, able to still function is because his job was, like, to get on stage and tell okay, jokes. Okay, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I mean? Like, he wasn't, yeah. like, having to think really deeply, right? So <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, it was super funny, so definitely check it out. Yeah. But that's cool. And if anyone's listening and, and can support that in any way, I hope yeah, they for yeah, sure reach definitely. out to you. I got some rapid-fire questions for you. Yeah. Uh, whatever comes to mind, first thing that comes to mind. Best business advice. Find somebody who's already done it. Do it exactly how they're doing it, but do it, but do it better. I mean, look at Tesla, right? They they didn't invent a car. They just built better cars. Love that. Best marketing advice? Show your story. Be vulnerable and get out there. Vulnerable, relatable, and showing your story. Most simple thing you can do. Glad you shared yours today. <laughs> Favorite part about entrepreneurship? The risk, the reward, and the long-term journey. I just love... I love waking up every day to go to a coffee shop and just doing what I want, where I want, how I want, with who I want. And if you're willing to go through those ups and those downs, you're meant for it. If you're not willing or if you can't handle those, then maybe it's not meant for you. But I love going through that journey of like just knowing how much it can actually scale and how far I can really go with it. Because I think a lot of times, like if it was just always going to be the same, I really, I mean, think about it, right? Let's say somebody makes 3K a month in their job. I mean, you wonder why people hate their job. In reality, it's not really because they hate the work. They just hate that they can't make more money. Mm. So it's like in a job, people aren't motivated to suddenly like, oh, let me go make sure today's a fantastic day so I can make this guy more money. You know, they're like, I want to do my own freaking thing. And when you build a business, you have that ability. Yeah, that was always my challenge working. I used to work in healthcare and that was always my dilemma with it is like, I felt like I was building somebody else's kingdom mm. and that really rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. And like, not that you shouldn't work for somebody else, right? I, I don't yeah. ever want to like slam on anybody that does. Like, I think just kind of know thyself, Yeah, know the type of person that you are. So I totally relate to that one. So I already know the answer to this next question because I've seen you many times there. And I, uh, <laughs> when are you most productive? 7.30 to 3... 7.30 to 3.30 or 4.30, I'd say. I'm the same. Yeah. With a workout in the middle of there, I always work out around noon. Okay, yeah. Which is why I leave at like yeah, noon. Yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. <laughs> um, so tell me one, this could be a secret about you or thing or something that most people just don't know about you. I can get very emotional very quick, positively or negatively. Hmm. And I, I, I think that's like, I can get very down easy, but I can get very motivated easy. And where I'm going with that is like, I care so much about every human being that's ever been in my life. So trying to help everybody is hard, but 
what I've always trained myself is that you can take a horse to a pond. You can't force it to drink. And when you do your job, you're doing your job, but you can't, you can't carve the path for everyone's life. Totally. You know, so I try and help everybody I possibly can. You know, I want that to happen. But then over time I've tried to help so many people, like whether it's for free or paying for my coaching or whatever it is, trying to help everybody. But again, it's not your responsibility to make everybody happy and trying to have everybody be successful, right? No one's responsible for your success besides you. So that's something I've tried to like really like train myself on is that like I'm motivated, I'm going to do my shit, but I can't force other people to do theirs for their own self. Totally. You know, so I would hundred percent relate that too, to even just like the idea of happiness. I was in a, I was in a long relationship at one point and, um, a lot of it ended because they put the emphasis on me being the reason they weren't happy. Hmm. And it was like, no, that's your job. Like I can help, I can be here, I can support you. But like at the end of the day, like happiness is on you. Yeah. Like that's totally your choice. I think that's true for probably most things. Yeah. What would you change about yourself? I wouldn't change anything about myself. I would grow within myself. So I, I think like I, I love who I am, but I think things that I would always get better at. Okay. Maybe the one thing I would change is like kind of a fear. I, I don't know. I've always had a fear of money. And I mean that in the sense of like, no matter how much money I'll make and how much money I do make, it's still hard for me to say, Hey, go, go buy this or whatever. Like I can go buy anything. I mean, I can't buy a jet, right. But I can buy almost anything I want. Not yet. Not yet. Right. But still then even something like that still gives me a, Oh God, you know, stuff like that. And it's like money comes back. Right. And this is just a fear tactic. And I was kind of raised in a family where it was like, no, 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 we can't buy that. Like we just don't have the money for that. Yeah, we go on to a, a trip to Switzerland, staying one of the best houses that Arnold Schwarzenegger stays in, but we don't have enough, we don't have enough, mo- have enough money for that. So if that's the case, then who could afford anything? No mm-hmm. one can afford anything. So that was always just drilled in my mindset that I was like, no matter what, I'm broke. No matter how much money I make, I'm literally broke. And that's something I've always tried to, you know, I'm still working on. I'm still like getting out of that, you know. But that's one thing I've always worked on. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I'm on the same challenge. I think it's from meet Sethi that talks about like your, your, your money dial or something like yeah. that of like having like spend money on the things you really enjoy and yeah. learning how to get good at that is also a skill in the same way of like saving money is a skill as well. Absolutely. Favorite part about Austin. The people and how close everything is to each other. The people, the answer I hear so often. Yeah. The community <laughs> in this town is unbelievable. It's amazing. So I have one final question before I ask that question though, I just want to acknowledge you for obviously so much heart of service and even kind of some of the stuff you were saying earlier about just like always wanting to help people and wanting to support and doing whatever you can. Uh, I can definitely say in the short time I've known you, I can feel and see that you're very relatable and easy to connect with in any way, shape or form. It's been cool despite like seeing your journey and the things you overcome and kind of like where you're going that you're just still open to connecting and meeting with people. So yeah, I appreciate that, man. Yeah. yeah. I just want, I want everybody to have an opportunity cause I know what it's like to literally be at rock bottom. I want everyone to have an opportunity to change their life, be successful, meet him, meet her, like be around higher level people, whatever it is. I want everybody to have an opportunity. I don't care who you are, but, it's your job to take advantage of that opportunity. Totally. Like I got a friend right now, you know, did you ever meet Donovan? Mm -mm. Okay. So we played high school basketball together and I randomly saw him at a coffee shop. I hadn't seen him in like years, but I saw him at a coffee shop probably six months ago, four or five months ago. Anyways, I was like, yo, Donovan, what are you doing here? He's like, dude, I literally have come here like every day. And I was like, Whoa, it's like, what are you doing? He's like, I got a job I hate right now. I was like, Oh man. Okay. I'm sorry to hear that. And I was like, you want to come hang out? He's like, yeah came to hang out and long story short like he's literally like and i've been literally helping him every single day because he is doing the work on building his own business and he's like one sale away from literally quitting his job and doing his own thing and he's like this has literally changed my life i've met amazing people i never thought this would happen and like i'm like that's exactly what i want i want everybody to have that journey but again let's say he didn't do the work i can't force him to start typing on his computer so that's why I love just helping everybody who takes advantage of the opportunity. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I love executors. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, amazing. That's, that's the biggest thing is like when I meet people that I've always said the number one skill of anyone who's ever wanted to pursue anything in their life is resourcefulness is like, just go out and figure it out or try stuff or just start, like you yeah. said, hitting keys on the keyboard. Like <laughs> yeah. you're eventually going to figure something out <laughs> good so, or bad. Yeah, right. Exactly. 
Uh, so final question. So like, this is a perfect segue to my last question of, I always ask people at the end here is like, if you were to go back to day one of that journey of just entrepreneurship and business, like you were obviously doing the keto programs and everything at that time. And like now to where you are today, you've learned a lot. What would you go back and tell your younger self or even anybody else like Donovan or somebody in that situation where they're earlier on and they're like, this sucks. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm still trying to figure this out. Like what's maybe the best piece of advice you could give to that person? It's kind of not common answer here, but everyone is just trying to figure it out. And basically what I mean by that is that a lot of times when people see somebody else, oh, I can't do that. It's like, why can't you do that? Because he's making a million dollars a year and he knows how to do this, this and that. I don't know exactly. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. And okay. In reality, he probably doesn't know what he's really doing. (laughs) He literally is just chopping away and hopefully he hits it and he ends up doing that because the more you chop away, closer you are to getting to that gold. But people usually just chop away one time and don't ever get there. And so they're like, yeah, I can't find it. Right. So it's literally like, that's the most simple advice because I've been around literally some of the biggest influencers in the game. Like, I've always looked up to these people my whole life. I've been around them. I've hung around them and they are intelligent, but they're literally just trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, it's, it's absolutely mind blowing when you hang around these people like Mr. Beast fantastic. I I, I met the guy, but I actually do know, uh, two big YouTubers that he does know. And these big YouTubers are super successful, but like I have like one of them has stayed in my place for two weeks and the guy's literally like, sitting there like stressing out because he doesn't know what the video is going to be tomorrow. And nobody knows what the video is going to be tomorrow. He's got to figure it out. So it's like, (laughs) when you look at it like that, it just, you're like, wow, okay. Life isn't as complicated as I thought it was. No. And it's really not. Totally love that. (laughs) That's great. Appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, dude. Thanks, man. Cool. Thank you. Before you go, I just wanted to say thank you for listening to the show and I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed recording it. If you're looking for simple, actionable tips on how to market your health or fitness business or need help with your website, just go to coreyhigh.com. Thanks again and keep hustling, my friends.